Welcome fellow wine lovers, this is the Wine Ghost Podcast. I'm Mate Vosch, a certified sommelier and seeker of hidden stories behind the most mysterious drink in history. If you have any questions about the topics we mentioned during the shows, please look for the Wine Ghosts on Instagram, where you can send your responses via direct messages, leave a comment under the episode's post, and also find every important contact information to our guests and to the editor. I would also recommend you to follow the Vine Coast Instagram site if you would like to be notified about new episodes, find some interesting takeaways and additional information about our guests and the topics we talked about in recent episodes. But now, please grab a glass, get comfortable and listen how today's ghosts get out of the bottle. And now, let me please introduce you to Sebastian Giraldo, who is one of the most entertaining people I know in the wine world. Sebastian originally comes from Colombia, but nowadays he is helping international tourists understanding the Hungarian wine culture at the tasting table in Budapest every week. He has recently took the advanced sommelier exam by the Court of Master Sommeliers in the US, so we went deep into his experiences at taking such a challenge, his favorite techniques to prepare himself, and what to look for in a great wine book. Sebastian also writes award-winning wine-themed articles for online publications, like the one on the topic of barrel making and the reasons why Hungarian oak is such a unique tool in international winemakers' pocket. He also shared his approach of working as a sommelier and wine educator and his non-traditional techniques to educate everyone about wine in a more approachable way. As a trained chef, Sebastian also recommends food wine pairings to Hungarian indigenous grape varieties and describes the peculiarities of the Hungarian kitchen. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode as much as I did. And welcome to the show, Sebastian. How are you today? Hi, Mate. Pretty good, thank you. You just recently came back from the US uh, and took the advanced sommelier exam a few days ago. How was it? Could you please maybe start with that and your recent experience? Sure, sure. Well, uh, it was very intense, uh, both emotionally and, uh, you know, mentally, because, um, as you probably know, is one of the hardest wine exams, uh, apart, of course, from the Master Sommelier, is one, one behind the Master Sommelier. So it's... Um, it's a tough exam. It's a three three part exam: the tasting, uh, the service, and the theory. And you know, uh, uh, me personally, I've been studying for uh, more than two years, pre- preparing for this exam. So I I, I was very nervous uh, the day before. Also, the the long trip was a was a challenge uh, because you know the jet lag and everything. You're, you're, you're tired, you don't know the country where you are, but you have to perform well. So it was um, it was an incredible experience. I learned a lot from it. And, uh, you know, speaking about the um, things I've, I've learned in this, in this process uh, and about the exam. And so it was, it was worth it. It was very hard. Um, I eventually, you know, you have to pass all the three parts in order to get the advanced sommelier, I passed two two of them. I passed uh, theory and uh, service, but I failed tasting. So I'm I'm not yet an advanced sommelier. I will keep trying though. But uh, yeah, this was a nice nice experience. And uh, speaking about the theory and also the service part, uh, which both of them uh, should pass both. And uh, you mentioned that you failed the tasting part, so you have to take uh, all three parts again, right? Yeah, yeah. This uh, so is different from the master's exam. So for the advanced, you have to pass the three in the same exam, let's say um, week. So if you don't pass any of the parts, you have to take it all over again, everything. Because you are being a Somali and maybe uh, and a young Somali, maybe since the first Som movie, it uh, the Somali profession is uh, getting more hype 
and getting maybe more trendy. Do you? Why do you think it isn't? Before the Psalm movie, this one school was not that well known. <clears throat> there was only a few, let's say, twenty or something people applying for the advanced, and now it's just hundreds of people uh, applying for that, wanting to be master sommelier. I think the movie is great. I think I don't have anything, uh, you know. So some people don't like it, but I but I found it amazing. I mean, it's it's like if you uh, re remember a few years ago, like more than ten years ago, cooking was a big thing. So to become a chef was a big thing. So Anthony Bourdain and Gordon Ramsay was just getting out. So it 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 was a big thing because people usually like to do creative things and wine tasting seems like a very nice thing to you know to to do for your living to, to drink wine and to be paid for it but the truth is that the as as the kitchen word is it's very uh, you know it's a regular hospitality work meaning you're working long hours you are not just only opening expensive wine and tasting it and tell your telling your opinion you are you know washing the Washing the glasses, doing a lot of cleaning, a lot of counting bottles. Uh, so it's it's not so glamorous the the life, of course, of the sommelier because a movie, of course, shows only the nice parts. Although this is a movie for showing all the all this hard part of the wine exam that I, for example, that I just took. So um, I I actually like it. I think it will it will start going down this height for sommeliers eventually just like the all the excitement about cooking is already gone uh, but I but I think it, it can only do good for it so we are all just you know getting more people excited about wines meaning more people drinking wine more people needing to know about it and here is when where where we come here and uh, try to explain and do a do a business so I think it it's a very nice thing uh, this movie is in all of this. Have you maybe met someone from the movie, or have you met yeah. any masters, or how sure. did the process go? Sure. Uh, yeah. Well, sure. I mean, um, I've met several of them. You know, this advanced course in 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 the Americas, where I started to do my my code of master sommeliers, is different than here in Europe. In Europe, the advanced course is five days. Um, and the first three days are classes. At the afternoon of the third day, you get your first exam, and then fourth and fifth day are exams. In the Americas, is different because, you know, some movies made in the States, so the movie Some was much more popular or made this whole school very, very popular in the Americas. So now it's a lot of excitement, a lot of people. Uh, wanted to to do these exams, so they had to, you know, divide it in two parts. Uh, you have to do the course first, which are three days of classes only, and then you have to do the exam in next year. So you can't do the course and the exam in the same year. You have to take a year. And the and the reason why they do it is because there's a lot of people that wanted to be advanced and they failed. Tremendously, because it's a big, big change from the level before that is called certified sommelier. So it's a very big change in uh, difficulty. So during this course and the exam, a lot of the master sommeliers uh, were people from, from the movie. So, you know, Jeff Cruz, which is one of the mentors of the guys studying, I've, I've, I've met him a few times. He was my teacher for the intro and the certified in Colombia. And he was one of the teachers for the advanced course. Uh, you know, a lot he's of... Also, he's also hosting the podcast, Guildsome, right? Yeah, he, he's okay. the creator of, of, of Guildsome. Yeah, I've, I've, I've met him a couple of times. And then, you know, Mario Sabato, which is one of the guys that is taking the exam. He's now a master sommelier. He was giving us some, some service uh, classes in the, in the course. And of course, a lot of other masters that appear just briefly uh, in the um, in the movie. I've I've 
I've got the the, the chance to to meet. So, yeah, could you share some some learnings? What you what you have gained from these classes? Maybe some some secrets what they whispered you? Ah, uh, sure. So or in the corridors. So usually, when 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 you attend these very high level um, classes. They always tell you that it's that you should stay, you know, humble, uh, which is an easy thing. When you when you start learning about wines, it's very easy to think you are very good already and you know too much, and uh, that easily goes to one's ego, you know. And uh, there's a bunch of people in the wine business that are not humble at all, so they. Whenever they get the chance, they will tell you, "Come on, it's only wine. Stay humble." And uh, the the core master sommeliers is very focused on the service part. That's one of their main, you know, things. So they will tell you that hospitality is the is the bigger, you know, the bigger goal that you should. We are we are there there to make the guest feel feel good overall. So we should do. All this knowledge is just for for the guest to have a better experience. So that's that's a nice thing that you always you I mean it's easy to fo- forget the reason why you are learning all of this is not just to show up. I mean, whenever you get a chance, just to show how much information you know, is to put it in an easy way, in easy words. I mean, uh, the guests don't want to hear about piracines and you know. TDN and Rotondon and all these fancy words that we know. They 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 want to know about the flavor profile of the wine, easy way, and about the kind of the the history of the place. So they always uh, re- re- remind you of that that you should you know stay stay focused, stay humble, and just bring a nice experience. Which is a, one one of the things that I that I you know take take with me is that you should always um, you know. Think of what we are here for. We are here for really, you know, giving a nice experience overall to to somebody. And uh, yeah, that's one of the things. Theory is a really hard part of the exam. And uh, do you have any special techniques how you prepare yourself for theory? Because you do have a really deep and detailed knowledge about not only wine regions, but also producers. And do you have any special tricks, or do you have a, a special method? Well, to, yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I love learning about wine. In, I mean, I mean the 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 theory part, all the context of it. You know, it's very popular because of the movie. I think that wine people think that the only way of learning is, you know, flashcards. And uh, that for my, for me, they don't work for me. Uh, so you have to search what's the type of learning that fits you the most. And uh, what I realized is that I am a very visual learner, so I have to see, you know, things written down. I have to write them down and see it again. So what I what what I did for the for for this exam. Uh, is that I printed a, a lot of wine region maps. I printed, you know, I don't know, as many as I as I can as I could, and I wrote with, uh, you know, uh, on top of the maps, what are the special things about the sub region. So, for example, if I printed Côte de Bonne, so next to each and every village or every little town, every little a- appellation, I would write what's what makes that different. So if, is that a white focus? Is that a red focus? What are the name of the m- important vineyards? The name of the important producers? And I created this little booklet um, with a bunch of wine maps and uh, just with my hand hand write it on top. So. For me, it's not enough to have the map. I have to personalize it. I have to write on top of it, and I I realize that that is the way that I that I you know try to 
catalog these huge amounts of inf information because when you when you see it overall when you see that little book finish it's a big is a big book i mean it's uh, a lot of information but the most important thing i think is that you have to catalog you have to classify that information somehow into your brain so you have to be you know you have to have a method it's not that you read here a little bit then you whatever you have a few flashcards i think you should do you should have a method that works for you and uh that's what i what i did i i yeah with my maps and stuff so that's how i um started but in order to make the maps before that i i read a lot of books so i for example i i i used a lot guild sum all the expanded guys and study guides they have they are very nice with that i also used um uh world uh, atlas of wine of, by hugh jensen or jensen robinson some years at atlas of taste by rajat far i also used the wine bible the um wine atlas of germany i mean uh, a lot of different books to search for the same information. So, for example, if I'm studying Burgundy, again, Cote de Bon, I would read about the same subject in every book. And then I would I would create my, my own version of it. So if somebody said, is, if all the books say that, uh, whatever, the best premier crew of Merceau is this, I probably need to learn that. <laughs> So, um, you know, that's what I, what I did. I tried to classify, to filter all these different books and sources into one little thing. And what, that thing was the, the wine maps uh, for, for me, yeah. I'm, I'm actually listening to The Dirty Guide of Wine. Sure. I don't know if you know this book. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it got me really excited about soil. I mean, I, first, I knew that this is a really important part of the of the wine uh, journey or l learning about wine but uh, I think it's also a great classification uh, to put different wine regions in perspective did, did you find it also helpful and also how because it's an important part of the book for example that if you really want to look for the through a region of the terroir that you have to drink uh, at least organic producers or organic wines to truly express the soil did you also find that interesting or helpful during uh, preparing yourself for the tasting part or during this learning method or well, period yeah well i mean i i wanted to do also uh, but i couldn't because of the time i i want to classify all the regions according to the soil so i like you know to see uh for example what are the limestone regions top wine winemaking regions that have limestone so then you would go and check whatever burgundy then you go and check other regions that have limestone and how are they similar that's one thing i have left to to do i will i, I will do it for my next attempt i think and uh that's very interesting because i think that soil have um, a big influence for example chalk you know champagne and uh, um, or marl you know chablis and how is chablis and sancerre so similar well they have a very similar soil right so i think soil if you classify the soil types of the classical wine flavor profiles and then you pair that with the flavor profile I think that could make you a very good taster but i think that in order for you to be very good uh, blind tasting uh, in wines you have to know your theory very very well so i think tasting and blind tasting it's kind of a byproduct of learning the theory of course it's a it's a different animal it's a it's a different category it's a it's a very hard hard one and uh, I mean it's 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 not a science it takes a lot of your senses 
But if you can classify what you are feeling in the glass with the knowledge you have already, I think that's the that's the key. That's the that's the secret. That's what I'm planning to to do in this uh, year I have until my next uh, exam. How the wines and why the wines taste like they do, and if they taste like that, why is that, and how is that possible? So that's I mean that's a uh, that's just the the next level of geekiness of uh, geeking out uh, about all that stuff. And you also worked as a wine educator, uh, if I'm correct. How did it help prepare yourself for the, maybe for the exam or or other certificates because you held a lot of papers or a lot of uh, certificates if i'm correct sure Maybe. I'm a, i mean i'm a i'm a wine geek i'm i love to to try a lot of different wine schools uh since as you as, as you mentioned i i myself worked as a wine teacher for a bit more than four years back in colombia in a culinary school called uh, mariano moreno which i also worked as a um, cooking teacher because i'm a chef as well so uh, what I, you know, studying all these courses, I've, you know, we, we, we did together the WSET level three. This year, I also did the Spanish Wine Scholar program for, from the Wine Scholar Guild. This year, I, I also was um, selected to go to the Canary Islands in Spain to do a, you know, a Canary Island wine and ambassador course and I've, I've I've done the society of wine educators certified specialist of wine so I've, I, I mean I, I I like to see what are the methods of teaching and when 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 you are explaining a, a topic that is so complex like wine you know and you you have to make it easy that's what I think so you have to make it enjoyable you have to make it exciting I mean wine is a very exciting thing and uh, when I would teach about whatever Bo let's talk about Bordeaux you know uh, so big and so different but so similar in a way what I would do is I first in order to teach something you have to know it very very well so that that helped me a lot in my theory because I have to get this very strong basic uh, knowledge of theory and then I would think, how can I put this into easy words and even funny words? Because I, you know, when, when I speak about wine, I try to be funny. I try to be, you know, joking, making comparisons of wine with people, with, you know, with, uh, for example, I would say that uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is a very lean and strong guy, you know, it's a guy that is very very muscular but has no no sense of humor it's hard to talk with it i mean it's 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 strong you don't want to talk to him it's kind of rough but when you blend Mer merlot with cabernet sauvignon it makes it easier it's like if this guy that has no friends you know it's it's nobody talks to him because he's so rude and so strong he has a friend that is softer that makes him you know loosen up a little bit, makes him want to talk to the other people a little bit easier, you know, makes it more approachable. So that's how Merlot works with Cabernet Sauvignon. I mean, Merlot softens you. If, if, it, if it wasn't for the Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon can be lean, mean, and strong, and tannic, and alcoholic, and not really a lot of charm. So, I mean, if you understand that Merlot softens Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, it's like Furmint, and harsh of value in Toka, you know, Furmint is acidic, is strong, is, is, you know, can be overly austere, but harsh of is floral. I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it's easy going, it's easy to speak to. So we all need a friend. I mean, there's always this geeky friend that always wants to study. And then you have your friend that always want to party, you know, so you need to, have a balance between them. So I, I would I would do co comparisons like that. Like Furmit is the geeky guy. You know, he's lean, he's lean, he's boring, but he's the structure of everything. And then you have this friend that is just want to take him out for a few drinks. Uh, and when you mix them together, it makes just a better, better, you know, better balance. So I would try to do stuff like that. I mean, uh, that's just my my approach. I don't take take things so seriously like exact 
hectare numbers and you know i would i would use them of course but uh only to put things into perspective more than uh you know um stronger things so it's like it's like you know making this uh subject easier i mean it's if you want to complicate your yourself there's enough chances for you to do that if i'm talking to you about wine i want you to to enjoy it to re, to you know remember this crazy guy talking about whatever people comparing that to to wines and maybe you can remember the wines that way easier and that helps me a lot too because i, I get to kind of understand them better so that's just how I how I like to approach uh, this wine topic. Just relating to that, you mentioned the summary Atlas of Taste, and uh, I know you really like this book, and uh, you also mentioned other books which are maybe more black and white, so to talk about hectares and you know only grape varieties. And but this book, what you mentioned, the summary Atlas of Taste is. Um, brings you somewhere. Do you have any other books or any websites or blogs but, or maybe YouTube channels or movies that you could recommend? Maybe not mm -hmm. only for wine professionals, but also for everyday people who want to learn something about wine. Sure. So what I what I loved about this sommelier atlas of taste, uh, which actually I had a mixed feelings because when I when I got this book a bit more than a year ago, I wasn't sure about it. So it was not the classical book that I was searching for with the facts, you know, like for example, guild gil, gil sum can be that goes straight to the point, will tell you this subregion makes this grape, uh, you know, that you need that too. But um, this book, I use a lot, the Sommeliatas of Taste, to know things like differences between the subregions, which is a big, big, you know, difficult information to get so for example what's the difference between the sub-regions of Bar Barolo or Barbaresco or Hermitage I mean how is uh, whatever Serralunga di Alba different from La Morra within Barolo and uh, in this book they will tell you about the, the people behind it because we don't have to forget that wine is made by people, you know, and people have a story behind it. So wine is not made by machine, it's not a recipe, it's not, you know, it's made by somebody who has a philosophy behind it. So if you know the main pr producers and their philosophy, that will take you into and just another level of excitement. So that book I use a lot for for example, knowing the producers from different regions, uh, and I actually write them down in a in, in a little book, and I would Google the pictures of the bottles, you know, because one one of the things that uh, it can happen on a, on a very difficult wine exam like this, like uh, the advanced or the diploma in the WSET or something like that, that they might show you a label of a bottle with something erased on it and then you have to tell what it is or what's the vineyard from it or what's the name of the producer or stuff like that so i think you have to get familiarized with how the bottles look like i mean uh, the top producers or so of every sub region and then i would have a uh, this document in my in my laptop with a lot of pictures of the labels. And that I found very, very helpful uh, for, for things, for example, as the, uh, you know, Tête de Cuvée or, um, or the, uh, you know, Prestige Cuvée of the Champagne Houses, which is a very difficult topic that they love just to ask you in, during during exam. What's the Tête de Cuvée of Paul Roger? And you have to know it's Winston Churchill and stuff like that. So I... I use that that book for that a lot. Uh, I would highly recommend that book for people searching for differences between, for example, the the cruise of Beaujolais. What's the difference between Morgon and Moulin Avon and things like that? If you are into that geeky kind of detail learning, of course, it's only for a few regions of the world. I mean, they only have 
the most important of France, of Italy, and yeah, that's basically it. one or two of Germany. Another book that I um, enjoyed a, a lot is the Atlas of Wine, the World Atlas of Wine, because they have great wine maps there. So you can see how the region is like, where the producers are located and stuff like that. And the other source, as I mentioned, that I used a lot was Gil Sam uh, study, you know, um, study resources, because that's the kind of classical wine knowledge that you also need. Like, you know, what's the difference between or what's the exact percentage of fruit allowed in Cross Hermitage of, you know, Marsan Rusan, and they will tell you that, that you, you kind of facts that you need to know. So, yeah, and there's this wine app uh, that's o- only available for iOS, so for iPhone users and stuff like that, that I, I, I think is simply called Wine Maps, and it will cost you like three euros or something for uh, to download. But it's worth it. Mo- most of the wine uh, maps that I told you about, I actually got from that app, and uh, it's worth it. I mean, th- those three euros will 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 go very very long. Pay off very quickly, yeah. Yeah, because you got that uh, incredible maps if you if you like wine maps and stuff like that. And uh, another thing that I found very useful are the official pages of the um, of the regions so for example the official page of Beaujolais or of wines of Australia or wines of Chile or you know wines of Greece they usually have incredible reliable you know information i specifically recall the wines of Austria web page is incredibly good the wines of South Africa webpage is very, very good, as well as the wines of Chile. I mean, but there must be much more. But those three, I remember, I browsed and I got, you know, a very difficult thing to have is reliable information, things that you can't trust, that are not just made by anybody. So uh, that, that would be another advice to go for the you know, official web pages of, of, I mean, if you can avoid w- Wikipedia and stuff like that, uh, it's better because, you know, go for the official information. That's an, another advice. And you also mentioned that, for example, Chile wine maps and you, you coming from Colombia, I think you have a, a very unique perspective. Uh, because you come from South America, but you moved to Europe. And what was for you maybe the biggest change or what were the biggest differences that you saw in, in comparison of the two continents and the two wine culture? Well, Col- Colombia is in baby steps. I mean, uh, <clears throat> we don't produce any wine because we are we have a t- tropical weather, so we don't have in, any seasons. Uh, it either rains or it doesn't, but <laughs> that's it. So uh, that's not that's not very good for grapes. Meaning we make uh, we drink a lot of beer and a lot of spirit called aguardiente, which is an anise flavored, like uso from the Greeks. It tastes very similar to, uh, to that. So wine is a is a new thing, and mostly all the wine that you can get in Colombian supermarkets and things like that is from Chile or Argentina because, you know, they are closer. And uh, I would say 70% of the wine selection of Colombia is Chilean and Argentinian. And the wines are pretty expensive too because they have to pay a lot of taxes. So it's it's kind of a, a luxury uh, to drink good wine. So one of the reasons that I decided to move back here to Hungary was to stay, you know, be closer to wine. Uh, since I, I knew, you know, wine is what I want to do. But o- over there, you can hardly find a vineyard or things like, like a winery or some, something like that. So that's one of the reasons why I moved here. And here you can find much more selection of different wines than in than in uh, Colombia in Hungary 
it's still not as much as you would like right because we, we would like to have wine from everywhere like you could find in london maybe or in in new york in san francisco and places like that where the wine selection is just incredible but here i mean we we, we can find good german wines good austrian wines uh, decent selection of french and italian things like that so i think hungary is just uh, I mean, a hundred times has a higher de- development of wine culture for sure than Colombia. So that's actually the, the the main reason why I moved here, and I've just enjoyed. I mean, it's wine is a uh, very much part of 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 the culture of the Hungarians, um, at least at drinking it. <laughs> they are very 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 good at that. Um, but the Hungarian wine itself is a very, you know, exciting topic. So, you know, uh, I'm I'm really excited of for, for being here. It's an exciting time for Hungarian wines. So yeah, I'm just. Uh, and what did you? What were your first impressions? Not only about Hungary, but maybe Europe, as it uh, it has a very long tradition, or maybe the longest tradition of wine. Uh, production uh, of all the continents and what what did you really get at first and what did you uh, get um, out of this region or this wine culture later so meaning of all the different producers and how people also drink the wine and enjoy the wine and talk about the wine and cultivate the wine and what what differences did you really get, and what what why do you think Hungary would be special in this little continent on this little continent? Sure. Well, I, I a lot of things I you know that show me that wine is pretty much part of the culture. One of the the funniest things is that when you see young people going out, you know, for drinks here in Hungary. You go to the city center and you see the young people drinking wine, you know, out of the bottle, you know, lukewarm. They don't care, but they drink wine. They don't drink beer or spirits. You know, young people drink wine, which is a, a beautiful thing in my eyes. I mean, uh, it's a it's a kind of thing that you want to see because it means that there's a culture for it. The other thing is that um, the fact that people drink wine that doesn't mean they know about it and uh, that doesn't mean that they know what they like yet they just you know it's cheaper than beer to drink a bottle of wine of cheap wine is cheaper than buying three or four beers so usually people go for that but i think hungary is getting in a in a it's, it's shifting from you know everyday kind of youngster drinking in the park kind of wine to you know um special wines, regional wines with some identity. That's what I'm seeing right now. So I would go for, uh, say that Hungary has a very special potential, a lot of different grape varietals, a lot of different wine regions. And the wine culture is is pretty much alive. So, I mean, I, I can only see good things coming for the Hungarian wine. Once. And also, you work at the tasting table, right? Which is a kind of special place in, in Budapest. And sure. you, can you talk a little bit about your work there? And also, what kind of works do you really promote? I mean, I guess you have a great selection of the most well-known wine regions, like well, maybe Vilain or Tokai. But do you, what, what kind of wines do you, do you try to offer the tourists, which are maybe not the most well-known? Sure. Well, I mean, I, 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 as you mentioned, I worked at the tasting table, which is a a, a wine tasting room here in the, in Budapest, and I'm 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 the head sommelier there, and uh, we we do wine tastings daily, two wine tastings a day, and we are specialized uh, for you know foreigners, and, uh, expats living here in Budapest, or people traveling in. We do all the tastings in English because our main goal is to share the excitement of Hungarian wines with uh, an international crowd. So 
And that's why we, we do uh, everything in English. And as, as, as you mentioned, we have a very nice selection of Hungarian wines. Uh, we have, I think, more than 250 or three, 300 different labels of uh, Hungarian wines. And we like things that usually Hungarians won't think of high quality. Uh, for example, we have a very nice sparkling coming from Kunshat, which is uh, the Great Thane area. It may be the, is the biggest wine area of Hungary. Usually Hungarians think of it as the bulk wine production, you know, the everyday supermarket wine, the two-year-old yeah. wine. And we start this eight wine tasting with a sparkling wine from there, made out of Ezerio grape variety, which is a local grape. So right from the beginning, we just love to to pour things that usually people misconceive as bad regions. And I mean, there's no such thing. We, we have very good wine from Matra region, which is also another region that um, Hungarians don't really think of high quality. Of course, we... We specialize in Tokai. We have one of the biggest selections of Tokai, sweet and dry, and we have old uh, vintages dating back to 1956. So we have a very nice collection of Tokai, uh, four mints and Kabar grapes, which is not so common, and Harsh Tovelu. But we also have, uh, you know, Vilain, Balaton region, and things, uh, yeah, just... We just recently had a master class of uh, of the Great Thane area of Kunshak, and we tasted grapes that even Hungarians don't really know very much, like Pozsonyi Fehir and Nero and stuff like that. So it's 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 a very exciting thing. And um, but to be honest, one of the big challenges we have is supplying of the wines because most of these incredible wineries are very small and family owned so they only make a very few bottles i mean maybe a few hundred bottles or one or two thousand bottles which they easily so you know sell uh, very easily so we have to change our wine selection constantly because we keep on having wines that we love our guests love and we can't have any more because there's no more of it. So it's a very exciting thing. And uh, that's actually one of the reasons why importing or exporting Hungarian wines is very hard because the the size of the wineries, mo- most of them are, let's say, medium to small. So if a big supermarket chain wants to buy, I don't know, 100,000 bottles, they don't have enough. So... Um, so 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 it's good we're a small place we're a small place we have uh, four tables i mean 24 people can fit uh but it's just enough just just how how, how we like it and um, yeah i mean we have a lot of different hungarian wines and do you have maybe a favorite hungarian wine region or where would you like to go where you have not been yet oh yeah well i haven't been uh, in in a few regions but i have uh a bunch of personal favorites. Uh, I mean, I'm one of those people that think that Tokai sweet wine is the best sweet wine in the world. I I strongly believe that. And I mean, and why do you think the reason is if not so them? Tokai Tokai has something that a lot of wines don't have, which is balance. Tokai has huge acidity. And being a sweet wine, to have acidity is almost impossible. As you know, when grapes, you know, shrivel into these raisins, they usually only concentrate sugar. But something about Tokai, and I think is the volcanic soil, makes the acidity also concentrate, which is, it's nonsense. I mean, it's unique. So when you taste a Tokai, it's not only the sweetness you get, is the balance with the acidity. A good Tokai wine will make you salivate, even if it's a sweet wine. So that's that's just incredible. And all the history and the stories and the tra- tradition and the being the first sweet wine region of the world, the second wine region overall after Chianti. I mean, being created in the 1700s. I mean, Tokai is just an incredible thing. But... Apart from that, I'm very excited about Chomblo. I think Chomblo is 
after Tokai the best uh, white wine region of Hungary. It's very unique. It has this very strong volcanic, mineral, strong, manly, salty, you know, is like licking stones with a lot of acidity because the volcanic soil keeps the acidity screaming high and the minerality of the wines is very strong and you have crazy winemakers there that are, are you know, make these incredible wines like Spiegelberg, like Schomblo Ivandor, you know, um, these guys are just incredible. And, uh, but we have, for example, Chopron, I think, is one of the most underrated regions we have in Hungary. Chopron is, is right in the, in the border with Austria and uh, they make incredible cake Franco's grapes, you know, these red wines that are sour cherry-like, crisp, you know, nice acidity, medium tannins, very easy drinking. Uh, but I think Chopro was left behind a little bit. All the wine regions, you know, Badachon in the Badachon Lake is getting very popular, V-Line and Sexar, the Neger and all these regions. But Chopron is somewhere, you know, behind a little bit. And I think Chopron has a huge, huge, a huge potential. So, um, and I mean, what? but if you ask me this next week, I will tell you different regions. That's how it is. But, <laughs> but okay, it, that's how you schedule another podcast. Great yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think what really could make the difference is uh, really the wine tourism, because uh, me living in Germany, we also have Lamberger here in Baden, uh, in, oh. in Württemberg and in uh, Baden, and in Austria, Blaufränkisch, and as you mentioned, Cape Frankisch in Schopron. And these are basically the same grape varieties, but I think what really could make the difference, what you mentioned, is also the faces and the producers behind it, but also the wine tourism, and maybe that even though these producers are very little, they have or they should have the capacity and uh, the motivation to actually introduce themselves and introduce the region. Do you? think that uh, being part of this project at the tasting table uh, would help and also because you also organize wine trips as I know. Sure, so we we are owned by Taste Hungary which is a tour company and uh, Taste Hungary is I think uh, was one of the first if not the first uh, tourist uh, company that specialized in wine and food and specialized in small groups. We don't do big groups. Our groups are eight, eight people tops. So we actually do, a, I mean, a fair share of, of wine tours. Uh, we take people to day trip to Tokai, to Eger, to Vilain, to the Balaton Lake area, to wherever they want to. And we show them, you know, the the wines. We take them to the winery. We we try to sh to take them to a tra traditional place to eat local food, and it's a very nice insight. I mean, Hungary since it's developing, you can go to the top producer of the region, and still be be welcomed by the owner, still be in his living room, you know having a nice glass of wine with the guy that made it how hard is that for for happening in france or in italy or in other country you know because they have these very established wine regions they don't have time anymore but i think hungary is it's an incredible region if you want to get to know the people if you want to get to know all the culture and we have to use the 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 fact that we're a small country i mean Toka is right in the edge of the country, in the eastern northern edge, next to Slovakia, close to Ukraine, and it's still only two and a half hours from the capital. So that we we take advantage of, and we uh, do these day day trips, uh, wine wine region tours that are just fantastic, and people usually like it. And when they are in their country, they will search for Hungarian wine. So actually, the same company, Taste Hungary. The, we started to import wines to the States. We actually are Hungarian wine importers in the United States. We, we, we send um, about 18 different wines every year. And we're trying to, to show, you know, people that Hungarian wine is one, unique. That's a, a lot of, 
you know, that's what people are searching for. They don't want to have another Cabernet Sauvignon from another country. They want to have the local speciality. And we have a lot of that. <laughs> and uh, we have great value. So our prices are just uh, very, very good. You get much, much more than you usually paid for. Uh, because, I mean, we, we can't sell our wines expensively. Uh, we don't have our our audience for that yet. So I think it's uh, our, our wines are also very cheap and they have a story behind it. So I think uh, the wine tourism is going to help develop uh, this country, showing how Hungary is unique because we truly are, I mean... To have all these wine regions in this small country squeezed in this little tiny country, 22 wine regions, and they are all truly, truly different. And I think we should take advantage of that. And also Hungary is getting famous or is being is famous for its barrels. And you also wrote an article. Can you maybe please describe a little bit about the Hungarian barrel making and what you what really stands out there? Sure. So uh, I was uh, I was glad to to be nominated as the best hung, uh, English language article about Hungarian wines with a uh, with an article I wrote in our blog in Taste Hungary. Uh, we, we we have a blog, and uh, I I wrote one about Hungarian oak. And then I end up uh, winning this award, uh, which was a uh, uh, very big, 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 big uh, joy for me. And what I learned about Hungarian oak is that, you know, there's basically two types of uh, oak trees. There's the Kerkus robur and the Kerkus petrea. So the Kerkus robur will make, will give a lot, very, very strong flavor. That's not usually used for wine. That's usually used for spirits like cognac and the high quality oak is Kerkus Petria, which a lot of people call French oak but that's actually only the v variety of the tree that can be planted everywhere so in France they they have different forests you know and uh, in Hungary we do have a few ones the most important forest are the Zemplin forest in Tokai, just outside Tokai. That's one of the things that make Tokai remarkably unique is that they don't only produce the best sweet wine in the world, they also produce their own barrels from the same region. How incredible is that? And then we have another oak forest called the Mecek, which is south of Hungary outside Sexar and V-Line regions. So Hungarian oak, you know, is usually the, they say that the, the highest quality forest is the one in, in Tokai, the Zemplin forest. And that, that forest uh, has a, a very special thing. It's very cold out there. So it's, it's pretty far north. So being cold and being volcanic soil, uh, like, Tokai is volcanic soil that makes the oak bar the oak tree grow very slowly and by growing very slowly it means that the grain is very thick the grain of the wood is very very small that means that the flavor the oak barrel gives to the wine is is less than the amount of flavor than let's say American oak can give that grows in a warm place so it has wider grain it means that it gives more flavor uh, American, oak, uh, American oak is another species of oak uh, so it's not Kerkus petra, it's Kerkus alba which gives this sweet vanilla coconut dill notes which are classical for American oak so Hungarian oak, why is it uh, different? First, it's the same species as French, but taste give a completely different flavor profile because French oak, we know how French oak ta tastes like, right? So you taste a big Bordeaux wine, you taste a big, you know, Northern Rhone wine, it's all French oak, tobacco, dark chocolate, cigar, cedar, you know, that, that kind of savory spiciness. Hungarian oak 
gives this butterscotch, this caramel and butter and toffee and a little bit of slightly sweet note without being American oak. So the Hungarian oak is very unique. I mean, I, I was I was watching a video about Klein Constantia, the famous sweet wine of uh, South Africa, and they use Hungarian oak in South Africa. And uh, I know some French people use Hungarian oak. I know some uh, people in California use Hungarian oak. So it's a it's a well kept secret in the industry that Hungarian oak is unique. Hungarian oak is not as expensive as French, it's much cheaper, it's the same species of trees, and it gives you a different per personality. So um, it's a very exciting thing. And most of the high producers of Hungarian wine, they use French and Hungarian or only Hungarian. And you can actually tell the Hungarian oak is slightly sweet, slightly jammy, and very nice kind of toffee roundness caramel but the but it also has this sandalwood this nutmeg so um hungarian oak is a is a very 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 good uh, actually a lot of italian wines are also aged um, with the hungarian oak because a very famous italian winemaker owns a barrel making fa facility here in the south of hungary and they usually take most of their barrels to Tuscany. So the, those are uh, fun facts that not a lot of people know, but uh, Hungary is a premium oak producer. As you mentioned, you were starting out as a chef and then uh, shifted to the wine industry, so to say. And maybe what a lot of people are missing about Hungary, it's not all about Guyash and Tokai. Maybe you could tell some wine pairings to some Hungarian traditional grape varieties like Furmint or a typical cake Frankish, as you mentioned. Maybe you know some Hungarian dishes or some international ones as well. Sure. So if you're not familiar with Hungarian cuisine, the Hungarian cuisine is basically uh, based on pork and onions and paprika powder. So... If you make a stew that starts with pork lard and then you put a bunch of onions and some paprika powder and any meat on top, that would be kind of the basic of Hungarian cuisine. But we, we love, for example, uh, dairy products. We love uh, cottage cheese or farmer's cheese. We love sour creams. Uh, I mean, we have this we, we have strudels. Uh, we, we love long cooking, so every type of stew you can imagine. We love pickling. We are the one of the biggest producers of foie gras in the world, and uh, we we eat a lot of duck. Uh, so Hungary is a very exciting uh, country. Uh, for we have incredible desserts uh, based with poppy seeds, with walnuts. Um, I mean, very nice stuff. So the, let, let, let's talk about the classical, you know, grapes of Hungary that people may know. Furmint, which is a white grape, usually planted in Tokai, but also widely planted in, Shob, in Shomlo, which is the volcanic uh, here, and also in the Balaton Lake area. So Furmint, if you haven't tried that, it's very similar to a high quality German Riesling. It has, a, has the acidity, it has the kind of plastic note, this petrol note, but it's very, very charming and has this apricot kind of, um, you know, orangish um, aroma. So furmin could be a nice pair for seafood, which we don't have any because we don't have any sea. But if you if you do have any seafood on your on your hometown, you should try it with furmin. Furmin can also be oak aged. So if you if you get your, yourself an oak aged furmin, which is a bit creamier, a bit rounder, you can put it with grilled grilled poultry, grilled chicken, even with some uh, very nice uh, you know vegetable soups, cream soups. That with an oaky furmin would work very nicely. Uh, another important grape for Hungary is the cake Frankosch, uh, which is a red grape. It's the same Blau Frankish of Austria. On the same Lemberger of uh, Germany and New York State, that's very sharp. Very, you know, has is 
It's a very nice and lean, easy drinking, um, you know, pretty, pretty high acidity, pretty low tannins, red, red cherries, red berries. Uh, so that would go with everything that has fat content, pretty high fat content. Like for example, dog breast, dog breast with that would be amazing. Any kind of stew soup, like goulash can also be very nice with it. Um, also a kind of grilled chicken, but with a stronger sauce, let's say with a paprika sauce or with a barbecue sauce and things like that. So when you have high acidity, you should search for, you know, big round dishes, like for uh, also like, um, you know, sausages that needs to cut through all that richness and fat. So I think cake frankish is good for that. I mean, and, and, the, and the list goes on and on. I think you should try and buy some more Hungarian wines and and we can help you with the pairings if you, if you hit us with some. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's some good marketing approach. Okay, Sebastian, where, where can listeners learn more about you? And could you tell maybe some contacts and also you mentioned the Tasting Table blog and do you have an Instagram or your own blog? and? Sure. I mean, I, I, I write uh, for the Taste Hungary blog, so it's tastehungary.com and then you go for the blog part. And I think that's the best source for learning about Hungarian wines. We have incredible writers. We have Sue Tolson, which is one of the, you know, well-known personalities of wine here. She writes for us as well. Caroline Banfavi, which is the owner, she's a food writer. So that, that's, a, that's a very good place to, to start. Uh, you can search me on Instagram. I'm Seti Hidalgo. You will you will find it in the, the description of this video. But yeah, you can find me on Facebook as well, Sebastian Hidalgo. But um, I think if you start with the Taste Hungary blog, uh, you can learn a lot from of Hungarian wines. And it's going to be a, a few changes now. Uh, it's going to be much more information, more articles, more blog posts. So stay Stay tuned with the Stay taste on the... Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay, Sebastian, thank you very much. And I wish you good luck for your tasting part and or for your next three part again next year. And thank you very much. For thank your time. you, Mate. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Bye.